And that seems to be working, great. Uh, let me now share the screen. Great. Well, thanks everybody for joining us for our first online version of the W3C Music Notation Community Group meeting. Um, we've used Zoom before uh, at, at Make Music a lot for, for remote meetings, but this is the first time I'm trying to host uh, something with this many people. So please forgive any uh, technical glitches and snafus. Like for right now, I, I'm sharing the screen and now I seem to have lost my participant and chat window, which I am trying to get back here. There's my participants window, great. So I can see who's there. I don't know if I can see my chat window, that would be great. And I'm not sure where that is. Well, hopefully somebody else will be monitoring the chat window. I will also unmute the co-chairs. At least I will try to unmute the co-chairs. So the way we are going to try to um, do this meeting, we'll see how this works. Again, first time hosting something this large. If you tend to have everybody's mic open all the time, you can hear every little sound that, that people make and that's not necessarily so good. But we also wanna have a lively discussion. So we want to, um, the, the general plan will be if you want to uh, discuss something, please go to the participant window and raise your hand and that'll jump you up to the top of the window so we can uh, see you. And then uh, somebody, that's why I need the chat window. I need to know whether, you know, what the order is for people, but people can whisper in my ear. Uh, whichever co-chair is not talking will be organizing the, uh, what order people will be uh, called on to discuss and probably be checking in after each slide to see if there are questions about uh, what we have covered and, and discussion of the topics that are involved. Uh, we'll see how this goes. This is all being recorded and we'll have the video available uh, soon after the meeting. Apparently, uh, Zoom will make an automatic transcript of the meeting, so we will see how well that works. Uh, I might be doing a little editing of the transcript before uh, sharing the video, but we'll see how, how well that all goes. And let's Let's move on, if I can, with my, uh, there we go. So I know that uh, for some people, this is the first time at a W3C Music Notation Community Group meeting, and for some you may not yet be members, we encourage you to join. Uh, just a little brief background on the group. We are founded about five years ago and are responsible for developing and maintaining format and language specifications for music notation used not just by the web as, as part of the web consortium, but also by mobile and desktop applications. So in practice, that means that we maintain and update the music XML and SMUFL specifications for music notation and uh, music fonts. And we are also developing a new uh, spec called MNX to handle new use cases and technologies that neither music XML nor SMUFL handle very well. Unlike W3C membership, community group membership is free of charge. It, you don't have to be a W3C member to be a member of the community group. And the URL there is where you go to join. And we encourage very much anybody who is interested to join. And if you want uh, contributions accepted, you know, if you wanna make pull requests and get them accepted into any of the specifications, we do require that you be a member of the community group before we can do that due to the intellectual property uh, uh, handling that is available in that agreement. So the agenda, um, most of the time will be spent probably the first half on music XML and the second half on MNX. 
with a uh, brief Smoofle update uh, in between. I'll be doing the Music XML update, Daniel Spreadbury will be doing the Smoofle update, and Adrian Holovati, the MNX status and progress uh, portion of the program. That'll be our, our big finish. So to start in on Music XML 3.2, um, if you were at one of the meetings last year, you might recognize this slide, but to, to, to reiterate, um, Music XML has its core use cases for music notation exchange and archiving. And we can improve how those work. As people keep on using Music XML, we find more and more things that we wanted to do for these use cases. We're also working on MNX to handle a whole new set of use cases, especially for native formats for web-based applications. But that work doesn't make Music XML obsolete and, and vice versa. The, the two can proceed in parallel and will proceed in parallel. A particular focus for Music XML, uh, an area that doesn't support well, is support for parts as well as scores and lots of suggestion and issues have come up over the past few years so that we want to take care of. So we want to be working both on Music XML and MNX in parallel, keep Music XML improving while we work on MNX. However, if we come up with issues that are just for Music XML that are just, they don't fit well into the design, it seems best to postpone them to, to the MNX common work. So that's one of the things that we use to guide what things to work on for Music XML and what to uh, save for MNX. So the current plans, we have about 40 open issues currently in the, 30, uh, the V3.2 milestone. There's, I think today the actual count is 39. And I've grouped, uh, I think there are six main themes, uh, support for parts, better support for machine listening applications, better tool support, fixing the gaps in preserving score appearance and in playback, and the never ending task of improving the documentation and clarifying things for several features. So those are the main themes. Doesn't mean that those are the only things that we work on, but that's the main areas of focus for this release at the moment. And the current plan would be to release that in the first quarter of 2021. Uh, originally we were thinking, hey, we could release it for NAM, but uh, Listening to the governor of California speak, I seriously doubt there's going to be a NAM show in January of 2021. Doesn't seem very likely given the current pandemic. However, uh, first quarter still seems like a nice idea for balancing getting a lot of things done for the release and being timely for uh, new products that want to take advantage of the features in the release. So this will be my first check in for people who want uh, have any questions or discussion on this. My plan is to go through each of the six areas and discuss what's involved in those. And then there are a couple of gen uh, more general uh, discussion points at that, at that point. And I have a more that is looking at me. Ah, I do have a chat window up. Great. Michael, my screen is cut off. Uh, I'm not sure. It's okay now. Uh, it was earlier, but it, it's, it got okay as soon as you started. Uh, okay, yeah, because there, yeah, there was a brief uh, time when I had that uh, paused, so that's good. And Daniel says, keep rolling, no questions so far, because now I can see my chat window and have much more security. That's great. So, uh, first area, improved part support. Many applications nowadays allow the editing of a score and parts in a single file. Uh, I think most music notation editors are allowing this. That wasn't the case when Music XML started 20 years ago. At that point, I think the only one that allowed that type of functionality was really Composer's Mosaic. Uh, Finale didn't at that point, Sibelius didn't, MuseScore and Dorico didn't even exist at the time we started uh, Music XML. So. Music XML was very much based on a paper model. So it was encoding, encoding either the score or the part. And there's no standard way to represent the relationships between the two. Um, this isn't so good for being able to share what the differences are between score and parts. 
and to be able to communicate all that together in a single music XML file. So issue 278 has the main proposal, which is really standardizing something that we developed for communicating between music XML, uh, between Finale and our smart music product uh, using conventions that were, you know, it's already using what's in music XML3, but using various conventions for how to specify things. We don't want conventions for something as important as parts. We want this to be specified. And the current proposal is that you can include the full score and a full copy of all the parts within the zip archive of a compressed music XML file. And then there are links that are specified uh, before each score part that say, hey, if you want to see the, the, the actual part that is associated with this part in the score, go look at this file in, in, the, uh, in the MXL file. That's worked well for us. It, it doesn't get the sophistication, the full sophistication of um, something that is more linked where you are encoding more of the differences between score and parts. That Encoding differences, A, gets very complex, and B, also runs us into some intellectual property and patent-related issues. So I think if we just have the full copy of the score, full copy of the parts, and let it up to the application to figure out what the differences are, that's probably the best we can do at, at this point. But if people have some clever ideas about how to make that work even better, that would be awesome. Um, another thing, though, is that we don't want to just limit the part support to just being something you can use with compressed MXL files. If you have a mu just a music XML text file, you should still be able to provide better support for creating parts, even if that's all you're exchanging is a score file uh, as a text file. And to do that, we need to do things like specifying the transpositions if you have a concert score. Music XML right now doesn't really like concert scores very much if you then want to do something like prepare parts because the only way it encodes transpositions is what is the transposition going from what I see on the page to a sounding note. There's no way to encode the transposition from if I have a concert score, here's what it will look like and on a printed part, even though that's just basically the exact opposite of what Music XML encodes, there's still no way to directly specify that. So Music XML Exchange tends to work better with transpose scores, but concert scores are getting more popular and that's a restriction that we really shouldn't have anymore. So being able to specify within the part, being able to the, what the, trans, the, the parts within a score file, what the transposition would be if this weren't a concert score is something that can help that out a lot. Another pain, uh, pain point is specifying whether directions, measure numbering, uh, I imagine several other uh, types of notation are things that are supposed to be just on the top staff or just on the bottom staff. Because right now they're on the staff that happens to be on the top or happens to be on the bottom. And that isn't really what you want in a lot of notation applications. You want to know that this is something that no matter, you know, in a part or in a score, it should appear on the top staff. So that's something else that we also want to add in. And there are, um, I think, eight total issues in this, uh, that are associated with this label. All, all the things in the upper right-hand corner are the, the various label tags that you will see in GitHub for these. Um, some of those issues are, representing requests that currently we're thinking will satisfy because we have the score and the parts and the application can figure out the difference. Um, but there, uh, and harmonics are one of, uh, an example of that. We should be able to support and harmonics. Well, it might be better just for the app to figure out the and harmonics from the differences rather than trying to do that type of linking, both for the technical issues and the IP issues that I mentioned earlier. But again, that this is just the first draft of what we're thinking of, and those uh, issues are all open for discussion and um, refinement as we go. So anything on parts before I move over to the next feature?
I'm not seeing any hand raised. I'm not seeing anything in chat. So I will move on to the next one, except I have to do it one particular way in this mode. So <laughs> that's a little weird. Okay, the next feature, and I wanted to make sure we got this before uh, Arsha. Oh, there's a question from Jim, I see. Are the IP issues enumerated anywhere? Um, I'm thinking in particular of a patent that Avid has on their implementation of the uh, parts feature in Sibelius. That's, that's the main one that I'm, I am personally concerned about. And uh, unfortunately, we don't have the Avid folks in here, uh, uh, current Avid folks. We have one of the pen holders in here, but he, he doesn't have any uh, authority at this point on uh, releasing the uh, IP. And they're, I think it, it, that's not just the only, if that was the only issue, maybe we could work around it. But if once you start going down that path, it can, it can get very tricky. I think that answers Jim's question. So now I'll go on to the machine listening. And I think uh, we still have Arshia here, which is uh, good because now we have two folks. It's, it's not just uh, my app that is using this type of thing. <laughs> machine listening, uh, applications. I'm using, that's a, a term that we used at uh, MIT and I'm, I'm bringing it over here. Uh, referring to applications such as interactive performance applications and music practice applications that rely on listening to a performer and relating what a performer is doing to the music notation that the application is displaying. And the uh, examples of these applications include our smart music application and the Metronaut application from, uh, that Arsha is working on at Antiscofo. Uh, Antiscofo and Metronaut is a music practice, uh, the, the interactive performance application, while uh, smart music is a music practice application. And these apps tend to need some supplemental data beyond what is required for music uh, display or playback. There are things that you can infer from the score, but there are also things that you can't infer from the score. And that's very similar to what we already do for playback. There are many elements of playback and encoding a particular interpretation of a piece, say for, for synchronization purposes or for playback purposes, uh, that are not things that are encoded in the score. A score is an abstraction of what is actually performed. And the play element and the sound element already encode this type of supplemental information. So the proposal is to have a new listen element that is in parallel to sound and play to distinguish things that are being used for listening applications versus things that are being used for playback, but really serving the same general type of purpose of being um, a way to encode semantically things that are not represented in the score, but are very much related to the score and that applications that use score, scores need in order to make things work effectively. So the listen element is sort of like the general purpose element for that. Uh, an element that supports it is a player element, which can be used to identify performers in Divisi parts. A music XML file currently has parts within a score and each part can have multiple instruments. But those instruments are intended for different sounds. So it's intended for a percussion section where you have a bass drum and a snare drum and whatever else that you might have in a kit. And those are separate instruments that you want to play back with different types of sounds. Or if you have a, a woodwind part that has uh, doublings between saxophone and flute, or if you have a condensed score that puts multiple instruments on the same staff and on the same uh, music XML part, those instruments can be distinguished in music XML, but it doesn't distinguish multiple players on a part. It doesn't, there's no way to standardly communicate. We have clarinet one and clarinet two, or we have uh, uh, voices, uh, we have three-way splits in a soprano part, and which is the soprano one, two, and three, which isn't even notated. It's just done as a three-way split and you're then supposed to figure it out. If you're listening to, a, if an app is listening to somebody and it's for a monophonic instrument like a voice or a clarinet, you really want to know what are they intending to play in, in this type of Divisi material. So a listen element that then, then 
says which player is associated with a particular uh, note can be very helpful for the, this type of the VZ situation. And there are other examples for listening, such as including waiting points for performance, such as fermatas and section breaks, some of which, like fermatas, would be clearly notated in the score, but others of which would not. Uh, Arshia also brought up a point about different, uh, being able to specify different ways of synchronization. Sometimes you want the computer accompaniment to match the performer, but sometimes you don't. You want the performer to match what's going on in the computer accompaniment. That can be in situations such as, say you're a trombone player, and if you're playing a trombone solo piece with piano, then you want the piano accompaniment to follow you most of the time. But if you are a trombone player in an orchestra or band piece and you're playing second trombone, in most cases, you do not want the band or the orchestra to be following what the second trombone player is doing. So different types of synchronization. Arsha also mentioned an example about the um, Ravel Lapkan Piano Concerto where the pianist is going to be swinging the part, but you don't want the orchestra to be doing that same type of swing. So the tempo may be similar, but the, the different types of durations, the, the, the smaller level synchronization is not something that you, you want the orchestra to be following what the, what the soloist is doing. So those different types of synchronization are also things that we could add into this listen element. I know that Bob Hamblock has had some concerns that this is going to add a lot of data that a lot of applications don't need, uh, but I don't think it's actually, it, A, it's not going to add that much data. It's certainly not as much data as uh, Finale, for instance, will include about the details of graphical layout that any app that is, you know, trying to display notation on a phone or a web browser with very flexible layout is probably just going to discard all that layout information anyway. So I don't think there's a lot of uh, extra data. And the type of data that it is encoding is stuff that is semantic uh, and related to music notation. And it seems that it, it belongs together uh, in the format and, and gives us the ability to open up a new range of application support for, for music XML. So that's the overview of the machine listening. So I'm again checking for hand raised chat window issues and give a minute for people to think, ah, Arsha has raised his hand. So let me unmute. So thank you, Michael. Yeah, thank you, Michael. So it was, um, it was a perfect uh, description of everything we discussed. Uh, I just wanted to emphasize for everyone who is not necessarily concerned with machine listening, um, that some of the examples that you actually described and you mentioned it in the beginning of your talk about the intersection between playback and you know these uh, listening elements, they can also be useful for pure playback. So you know the 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 all the synchronization section examples that you described uh, at the end of your presentation, they can be also useful for everyone who do uh, you know, artificial human playback, uh, uh, whatever, to you know, uh, use that information to add more swing or you know, uh, make desynchronizations based on some specifications that make it useful. So we used to be um, you know, researchers working in contemporary music, but now with the Metronaut, uh, we tap into all sorts of music, uh, mostly classical music, and we see that actually a lot. It's way beyond, you know, the, 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 the Ravel left-hand concerto. You see those paradigms in many pieces. And as the level of musicianship increases, people want to actually annotate that kind of stuff in the score. You know, uh, when there are people who, so, you know, we always say that metronomes is for amateur musicians, but when, when, when professional pianists, for example, they use it, they want to decide how they interact with the content. So, you know, it makes sense at some point for editors to consider, you know, adding those uh, uh, attributes and music XML can do that. Of course, we do it. We use mix music XML for doing that. We just, uh, on the GitHub issue, uh, put out two uh, issues that can be maybe of general interest. I'm sure the crowd can come up with, with, with other issues and uh, we are supportive of the initiative. Great, thank you.
and I'm reading Mike Cuthbert's. <laughs> and Mike Cuthbert uh, saying, let's keep the data in the encoding. Uh, our data is small compared to video. That's certainly true. <laughs> Anything else on this before I don't know? Oh. And a, yeah, Jim, I think, I think that's good if we uh, come back to that in the more general part of uh, when we get to the end of the Music XML presentation. So please, uh, Raise your hand or 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 redo the uh, the issue about digital scores um, at that point. If that's okay. So I will move on then to the next issue if I can. Yeah, there you go. Improve tool support. Um, let's help out our, our uh, application developers. Uh, I think most of the people on this call are application developers, uh, not everyone I know, but uh, by enhancing our support for uh, contemporary XML tools. Uh, one example was uh, Philippe from uh, Antiscofo uh, proposing that we add support for XML catalogs. Uh, XML catalogs were around before Music XML 1.0 was invented, but they had hardly any software support. So when Philippe brought this up, it was like, yeah, how much software support is there? Well, I checked a, about a week ago and there's a lot of software support these days for XML catalogs. So that would be an awesome thing to uh, add in. And if, uh, Arsha, if you uh, see Philippe and you can ask him to join the uh, community group, then we can actually accept his pull request uh, as is. But until he, not just you, but he is also a member, that's, that's going to be a little tricky. Um, so, um, XML catalogs, for those who don't know, if you're validating a music XML file, um, by default, that validation against the schema or the DTD will go up to our web server at musicxml.org. That's low. You just generally don't want to do that. You want to be validating against a local copy of the schema or the DTD. But and you can do that in most software applications, but it's kind of painful. XML catalogs make that a lot, lot easier. So it's, uh, we would provide a standard catalog where basically your application takes that catalog and in one place you substitute what the location is for the schema and then it works a lot easier with a lot of different uh, uh, XML parsing software. So that sounds very promising, something that we can uh, add in. Another issue that has come up is namespaces. Namespaces are another technology that was around when we were developing Music XML, but really wasn't being used that much. And now it's being used all the time. The problem with namespaces is that we can't just add a namespace to Music XML without breaking compatibility with older Music XML files. And it's really nice to be able to take Music XML files generated from older applications that may not even be around anymore and be able to open those in your uh, newer applications. So the proposal here is that if somebody is combining music XML with other XML vocabularies in some sort of web-based application, that issue probably doesn't matter to you. What matters is being able to combine music XML with other types of data. So let's have a standard namespace for applications like that to use so that they actually can combine music XML with other XML vocabularies. The tricky part there will be to make sure that people don't then use that namespace for standalone music XML files in a way that breaks compatibility with, with other systems. But I, I think we, there should be a way to, to thread that issue so that we can uh, make it clear that this is for a particular restricted type of use. And maybe there's someone clever out there who can figure out a way to actually have the namespace work without breaking older XML files that I haven't been able to uh, figure out how to do. So uh, let's see what, what happens with that and, and what we can improve there. Uh, documenting solutions to common code generation issues. A lot of folks use different code generator tools that take the schema and they automatically generate the data structures for your language. Except again, this is a technology that really became popular after 
we had developed music XML. In particular, we first developed music XML as a DTD, but most of the code generation tools are using schemas. And the way music XML is done causes problems for different schemas uh, to automatically generate things. But most people using code generation tools have figured out how to solve these issues. So let's share that knowledge about what the common code generation issues are and provide guidance to new application developers so that not everybody is stumbling into the same problem and rediscovering the same solutions. Let's get some uh, recommended practices in there for using code generators. And obviously anything new that we do uh, for Music XML 3.2, we would want to be uh, something that works well with code generators. We don't want to add any new problems to the area, but we want to smooth the path for, for people using those tools while still maintaining compatibility with older music XML files. Um, there is another idea for having an XLT, XSLT style sheet to automatically generate the ID attributes that we use in, uh, that we added in music XML 3.1. Sounds like a great idea. And it's something that, you know, as a separate style sheet, if you don't want it, it you know, don't use it, you know, it, it adds no, no extra cost to applications and also figuring out the best way to update the schemas and DTT locations to reflect that those are now all being served on HTTPS rather than HTTP. Apparently there was one set of issues where one set of software couldn't do the redirect and another set of software had trouble just using HTTPS. So we'll figure out what's going on there and, and try to make things work as, as well as possible for the current state of where the schemas are being hosted and the, the current state of HTTPS support in different validation tools. And I see a chat question from Jim about does music score diff and patch belong on this list? I'm not really sure what that means because there are certainly general purpose XML tools that will uh, do XML differencing and create patches and things like that. I'm not sure what is specific to music XML in, in that aspect. So want to raise your hand and speak and elaborate on that. Be happy to discuss that further. Raise hand and it goes right to the top. This is great. I love the usability. Okay, Jim. Um, yes, for diff and patch, I mean specifically some uh, way of comparing two digital scores and getting a concise statement of differences in a way that makes it easy for musicians to exchange um, performance annotations, cuts to an opera score, um, and packages it in a way that's um, useful for musicians to come up with updated scores. I suspect that generalized XML com differencing tools might make a hash of it in some cases. Um, yeah, they, the XML differencing works well for musicians who read angle brackets. <laughs> they, don't, they don't present it in ways that are, are useful for musicians. I think that type of tool sounds like something an application developer would develop more than this community group. However, if there's anything we can do in music XML to make that differencing work better, that would be, uh, that would be uh, great. And uh, Jeremy wants to talk with you offline. So maybe Jeremy is the application developer you're looking for to do something like that. Yeah, musically, as Jeremy mentions, musically uh, sensitive uh, differencing versus minimal music differencing is really hard, Mike Cuthbert says. He said, two smart master's students at MIT work on the problem and they're still not solved. Anybody else on the, uh, with questions about the improved tool support? Doesn't look like it, so I will move on. How are we doing? Oh, we're doing great time-wise. Okay, gaps in uh, appearance. So as, again, as Music XML has been used for nearly 20 years, <laughs> wow. Um, we keep finding, you know, as we solve the problems for transfer of lots of different aspects of music notation, we keep finding more and more details where things are not yet transferring over. So 
this list is a heck of a lot more detailed and nitty gritty than the list we would have come up with, you know, for uh, Music XML 3.1 or 3.0, which is great, but there's still stuff that is um, really limiting and causes problems in particular types of repertoire and would be great to get them fixed. Um, uh, of the eight issues that are currently in the list, um, piano pedal lines that don't explicitly have a piano uh, up at the a pedal up at the end of the line. And so you get a piano pedal line that extends throughout your entire score if you uh, have a typical importer. Something we really should fix and has, uh, I think, a pretty simple solution to that problem. There are different styles of guitar bends, of polychords, of enclosures, of ways to uh, display measure numbers in multi-measure rests. And none of that is something that can be directly encoded into Music XML. And again, these are all things that should be pretty simple and straightforward to add into existing Music XML structures and provide for a better level of exchange between different applications. Percussion staves with widely spaced lines actually brings up a couple of different issues. In, uh, we found this in, in working on the Finale export for percussion music. If you've ever tried using Finale, uh, if you're using it as a reference application or something and wondered why your two and three line percussion music didn't export anything like what the music XML spec said it should look like, uh, we fixed that for the next uh, maintenance update of Finale. And in doing so, we realized that if you have, say, a, a two line uh, staff for percussion and you're differentiating between a note hanging at the bottom of the, off the bottom of the first line and a note hanging on uh, resting on the top of the second line, you can't do that in Music XML. Those are both the same pitch. There's no way to distinguish those as being separate pitches. There's also no way to distinguish that you have a wide spacing between those two lines because you want a wide spacing between the two lines on a staff and not because you're scaling up the entire staff. So, Oftentimes, if you're importing a two-line percussion staff and you've specified, oh, the, 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 there's twice as much uh, staff line distance as there is in a normal staff, you'll find that all your notation is then twice as big, which is not what you want. So there are a couple of issues there, which is one, to be able to distinguish differences in staff line spacing for scaling or just to space them out wider. And the other is to be able to distinguish that, that type of percussion music, which although it's not very common, we do see it in a couple of different reference books. It seems like something that we should support. I think the way we're going to wind up supporting that is to be able to specify particular lines on a five line staff as being invisible because I really can't think of a way to get that to, to work out so well uh, in Music XML another way. Uh, another issue is improving the vertical alignment and positioning for lyrics and measure numbers. So there is uh, another issue is whether it's now time to tackle some of the other alignment issues. And I, I think uh, Christoph at the very least would say it was time to do that 10 years ago, but now. <laughs> uh, so I think I know uh, one person's answer to that, uh, but this might very well be a good time to tackle issues like when you have a rest display step, what does that mean? What is the reference point for where the rest should be on the staff? When we did Music XML, there weren't, uh, the original version 1.0, there really weren't standards for fonts. Now there are, there, there, there's the Smoople standard and the Smoople standard specifies where these rests should be and the answer should be, let's do it the way Smoople does it. Um, there's also a question about exactly what is the default X, the, the horizontal origin for bar lines? Is it the right end of the bar line? Is it the left end of the bar line? Is it the center? And I think with experience, we have found that center is probably the right answer at this point. So uh, I think it might indeed well be time to tackle this and other alignment issues. So if folks agree, we can also add that into the scope of the 3.2 uh, milestone. Those, those issues currently aren't there yet. And I'm looking now through some of the uh, chat issues on this. Uh, 
Uh, so I'm looking through there. There's been some mention about format converters, full unambiguous documentation. Yep. And Philip is signing off. Ba 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 ba. Yeah, we'll be discussing more about documentation in two slides. But yeah, uh, I think the George and Christina uh, add their support to being able to solve these alignment issues. I mean, these are cases where, yeah, it's not that the documentation is, is it's not the documentation's fault. It's that the, the spec itself is, is uh, not fully specified there. It, Music XML does not specify what, what these things are. So yeah, it's removing the ambiguity in the specification, more so than the ambiguity in the documentation. But I'm not seeing any hands raised, and I think I have covered what is in the chat. So I will move on to the next slide, make sure we have enough time for the MNX part. Um, gaps in playback, similar to uh, gaps in performance, you know, as, uh, as in appearance, as we do more and more work, you discover more and more different issues. Two big ones here are adding support for swing that actually matches how applications work. So how do you specify, you know, various types of swing playback? Most people have a, some sort of numeric parameter where you add a certain percent to one note and you subtract another, the, the, the same percent from the other note. Um, in Music XML, the way that this was figured to be handled is this is why we have a difference between the duration element and the type element. If you want to specify swing uh, semantically, you can just make the durations longer on one note and shorter on the other notes, uh, which the idea there was that that would make for great transfer for MIDI, but that isn't the way that 99% of music notation applications work. Nobody uses that. So let's have something that is much more parameterized type of, you know, playback that, that does match more how, how applications are working and, and do it in a way that is understand, you know, not Preferring, preferring, preferring one particular application or another, but something that makes sense in musical terms that is easy to support the way that different applications are supporting swing. Another uh, big area that comes up is when you're doing virtual instrument changes for doublings. If you are playing on a sax part and then you're moving over to flute and then coming back to sax, um, if you're doing this with MIDI instruments, no problem. You can just use the uh, the sound element and specify the change in the MIDI instrument, but you can't do that for a virtual instrument. If you want to do this for a virtual instrument and provide an instrument sound that we added in Music XML 3.0, you'd have to have two different instrument in, in, instruments in your score part and then specify which instrument for every note, which is not what the instrument was intended for. The instrument element is intended to disambiguate uh, between two instruments that are playing together, either in a percussion part or in a condensed score. For doublings, we really want to be able to change virtual instruments the same way we change MIDI instruments. And then there are a couple of uh, smaller issues with uh, the ending element documentation and uh, everybody's favorite instrument, the tin whistle. But the, I added that one because the sounds.xml file, we have like 880, I think, different instrument sounds. And we did that as a separate file so that we could update it more often, but we haven't updated it in 10 years. It came out in Music XML 3.0 and we didn't update it at all in 3.1. So it's actually updated slower than, than the rest of Music XML rather than faster. Um, well, 880 instruments is a lot, um, but there could well be the need for something more. The, the tin whistle is, is one example that has come up. Somebody suggested uh, adding E flat trumpet. Again, the, 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 the idea for the, the instruments in the sounds.xml file is basically to support uh, a higher level description of the sounds that you would be using in a virtual instrument library. So you don't have to specify exactly the patch that you have, but you can specify more generally what an instrument is. It, does, it doesn't include some of the more broader concepts of instruments that you can find in, in some notation software. And if 
the same instrument, uh, basically the same sounding instrument has different names in different countries. We usually, but not always, try to collapse that into a single instrument. But if there are gaps in the sounds.xml file where you're finding that you can't map it onto things in your favorite virtual instrument library that you would like to be able to do that, or whether it's something that you've bundled in your application or that you, people are using in your application, let us know because I think this would be a great time to revisit the sounds.xml file and see what we can do to improve that. Check on, and George had a, had a follow-up from the previous part about uh, playback that if XML doesn't specify coordinate origin, origins, then the documentation should be clear. And Daniel has something on the swing. Uh, interpretation value from a global list. And yeah, uh, Daniel's suggestion is uh, being able to choose from a list rather than have a numerical value and it could be up to the software solutions and you know similar to what we're doing in sounds that yeah sure that's a another possibility for that and we could be discussing that uh, in that issue on github uh, uh, music performance markup model for describing different performance parameters great thank you very much for the reference we'll see what that is like and uh also have to see you know if if the the source of this is something uh that has the rights for us to uh borrow ideas from that for for using within uh, music xml as in the uh, author of this is also a member of the uh community group is that is that benjamin bowl bwb thanks very much for the uh suggestion any, I don't see any hands raised. I see just things on chat and I think I've gotten to those. So I will go on to the next slide, which is everybody's favorite issue, documentation, the never ending task of uh, fixing places where the documentation is incomplete, inaccurate or confusing. Uh, 12 issues identified so far, not counting the ones that also are in other categories, like we don't document where the, uh, uh, where the uh, bar line reference point is. Uh, so one issue that I'm counting in documentation because it's somewhat documentation, but not entirely, is the Roman numeral analysis. Uh, but I think in the discussion of that issue, there's more going on here than just documenting how to use the existing harmony element for Roman numeral analysis, but also extensions to it to make it work better for Roman numeral analysis. For this, we would need uh, some volunteer to help complete the design because you do not want me designing Roman numeral analysis because you get something that looks like Music XML 1.0. I'm a total beginner in that type of thing and I don't have the background to deal with the, the sophistication of that as it's used at a more professional level. So if we have volunteers to uh, improve that and build that out, that would be awesome. Don't, don't need to commit now, but just something to keep in mind for as we, as we work on this in the future. And Mike Cuthbert is glad to volunteer. Great. Yeah, come, come up with a proposal, uh, uh, document a design, pull requests, whatever. That would be awesome. And we can uh, split, split that, probably create that as a new issue if there are new features as opposed to documentation of existing features. I think that might be that might help uh, structure the discussion to create that as a new new issue, which we can add into the uh, into 3.2. And then uh, we'll also take another look to see if we can move our Music XML 3.0 documentation, which we did at Make Music on our Make Music website, and see if we can move that over to the W3C site updated for Music XML 3.2. We didn't do that for 3.1 because it was created with proprietary tools that uh, with people who are uh, the folks who worked on it uh, either are no longer with the company or uh, are doing other things and their older version of the proprietary Flare tool, which are hard to use with new versions of Flare and it was a big mess. Uh, but we can take another look at that. There are certainly tools that take you from the schema 
to documentation, which you could then enhance. And that was the type of tool that was used to start off the documentation. So we'll see what we can do to make it, to take that documentation and move it onto the GitHub uh, site. And because if we could make that type of documentation, the community report for Music XML 3.2, that, that would be great because a lot of people are going to the 3.0 documentation because it's a lot easier to figure out than looking at the schema file. But when they do that, they miss all the Music XML 3.1 features and that's not good. So no commitment on that, but we will, this is a good time to take another look and see if we can make that happen. Any questions on the documentation area? I don't see any, so I will move on. Things that we are postponing to MNX Common that are common suggestions. Um, this is, uh, I think, a list that I've, I've had similarly, but improving the semantics for text for the, a lot of things in text are in the words element. And the only way to really semantically differentiate them is from play. And it'd be better to have semantics more identified in the words element, but that really doesn't go well with the music XML design that's much better suited to MNX common. Similar things for all the different types of brackets and lines and anything that breaks compatibility with older music XML versions with very limited exceptions for things that we know no software is using, especially if it was something that was added by mistake in a earlier version. We actually did take one of those things out. So there are you know, some things that would be valid 1.0 files that are not valid 3.1 files, but in practice, there aren't any of those. Uh, but those are the things that are being postponed to MNX common work. Is there a place to have official MNX examples on specific elements? Yeah, uh, that's, that's part of what we would want to have for uh, official documentation. I mean, that's part of the great value of the current, current site. Clarification of the default meaning of the meaning of default Y on stems. I don't think so. If there's a issue with what that means, then I think you'd want to raise that separately because I'm, I'm not sure where, where the ambiguity is on that, Christina. Moving on to now the, the next steps for Music XML 3.2. Just want to get a general sense of the uh, room. Does this seem like a reasonable scope? Are there additional areas that we should be working on? Or are there areas that have been proposed in these six that, yeah, maybe that's not such a good idea and we shouldn't be doing that? And then everybody's favorite type of question, version numbering. Is 3.2 a good number or should we perhaps call it 4.0? We've never done a 0.2 release. So I'm, I'm kind of inclined for a 4.0. One of the reasons for doing Music XML 3.1 was to not make people think we weren't working on MNX Common, but as you'll see, we're doing a lot of work on MNX Common. Um, we can do the two in parallel, so I'm inclined to, to go with the 4.0, but let's get a sense of, uh, of what, uh, what the group thinks. And just reemphasizing the current milestone list is a work in progress. So if your favorite issue hasn't yet been written up, or if it's been written up, but it hasn't been included in the 3.2 milestone, this is the time to add them and let's get discussions going in GitHub. Because if this sounds, if the group agrees, this sounds like a good starting point for Music XML 3.2 or 4.0 work, we can start work on that next week. You can make a poll or have a co-host make a poll between three point, you mean a poll within Within Zoom or within Zoom, where? <laughs> show, show us how. And yeah, sorry. Uh, making sure any, any questions, comments? I think there's a, also a way to do like a thumbs up and a thumbs down, a quicker release for 3.2. To, uh, I think, Daniel, I think if we want to get it, uh, how early before next year? Because I think we could get the current scope of 3.2 slash 4.0 out um, by the end of this year, if it's September-ish. Hmm. 
We have one volt for 3.2 and one volt for 4.0. <laughs> um, I'd really like, it's certainly easier for my, my working. Oh, we, we're like split half and half so far. <laughs> Uh, to to be able to do this type of work in one, I, I don't want to take the current scope of what we have in mind for 3.2 and split it up into two releases. I, d I don't think that's particularly helpful. If we, if uh, October-ish and yeah, I thought somebody might mention semantic versioning. I, I, I forgot to mention uh, semantic versioning, I don't think really works so well for a format like music XML where we don't make backward compatible changes and the format moves pretty slowly. Otherwise, you never, you never get a major version number release and you wind up with things like Java where you have like 1.19 or something, which I don't think is very user friendly. Semantic version is great for lots and lots of things, but I don't think it's particularly good for, for our situation. So I'd rather be more free form and when we do major version numbers. I think that's a similar point to what uh, Eric has in mind. So, unless I haven't figured out how to do a poll here. Save chat. I'm not gonna spend too much time on trying to figure out a poll feature. So, alas, I'm pretty sure that is, maybe it's a feature, okay. <laughs> I will, we don't, again, we don't have to decide the, the version number now. We can, we can keep it as a, a, a 3.2 thing and have more of a discussion on, uh, make a, probably have a, a GitHub issue on that or figure out a, uh, put a poll and uh, on a Google form or something and have people fill, fill that out uh, to get a, a better sense of things because trying to do a poll here probably isn't the greatest. This is one place where the, the, the online meeting, I think, gets in the way a little bit. So moving on, just a couple more things before I hand it over to Daniel. Um, again, as I mentioned earlier, if you want to contribute a pull request to Music XML, MNX Common, any of our other projects, you need to be a member of the community group and membership is free of charge. So if you're not yet a member, please sign up at the community group uh, homepage click on that join or leave this group button to uh, get started with the process. If you work for an organization that does music notation, like a music notation software company or a publisher, please join as a representative of that organization. If music is your side interest, you know that you're a professional performer, we're not asking you to commit your orchestra or something, but if you're doing music software things, as a job, then the IP transfer needs to happen from the people who own the IP, which is usually your organization. Um, and also we apologize that the W3C signup process, not always the easiest to use. So please reach out if you uh, run into any stumbling blocks in, uh, uh, with that. And I think that is all I have for the music XML part. I think this will now get us onto Smoofl. So if there are any last music XML questions, I do it by a show of hands. You mean like uh, having uh, raise your hand if you, I, I mean, there's a, there is some sort of thumbs up, thumbs down feature, but I, I don't think every, I'm not sure quite how to use that. You, visual hands? We could do, uh, let me see if I can get into gallery, a uh, gallery view here. Yeah, we can, we can certainly, uh, then we will need people to be on, on uh, visually, but yeah, uh, let's, let's try that, uh, Christina. So yeah, uh, can raise hands for people who prefer version 3.2 as a version number. I think a lot of people do not care. So hands, I, I'm seeing one, two, three-ish hands for 3.2. How many people prefer version 4.0 as a version number? 
there seems to be a, a two to one margin, but I wouldn't put much scientific evidence on that. So it seems inclined toward a 4.0 over 3.2, but I think we will want to do a little bit of follow-up before saying that that's the uh, decision. And uh, now I have to get out of this mode so I can see other things. And uh, is anybody, Michael has a question about whether people are interested in continuing or developing the Lily Pond Music XML test suite, which Michael forked a while ago. Um, we're running a little short of time on discussion questions so we can perhaps follow back on that after, afterwards. I think there's also some interesting uh, test things going on in the MNX uh, world that might be relevant. So let me move on then to the Smoofle. Thanks very much for everybody's participation in this great discussion. Uh, pretty good for, for this type of online thing. So Daniel, you should be unmuted. If you're not, let me know or raise your hand. Nope, it looks like a, no, ah, there you are, there you are. Unmute Daniel. There's a lag on this unmute button. That is, I'm, I'm really trying to unmute you. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay, there we go. Speak for goodness sakes. That's my one usability issue. That unmute button has a lag on it. And I, I keep clicking it twice, which then just winds up muting you again. Again, it's like a useless machine. Thanks. <laughs> um, okay, well, there isn't actually a huge amount to say about Smoothful, I'm afraid. We're pretty much in more or less the same uh, spot we were a year ago at the last um, Mesa community meeting. Um, at the time, this slide said, aim to complete Smoothful 1.4 before the end of 2019 didn't manage that unfortunately um, but uh, it is still um, an active project of course I'm still making changes to Bravura um, as the reference font as I'm needing to for my day job as it were um, and you know there have been some new issues added since last year I've added three more issues um, to the scope for Smoothful 1.4 so uh, you know you can see that the kinds of ideas that are that are in the um, milestone at the moment, and again you can find a smoother one point four milestone or label on the um, on the GitHub page if you want to filter the issues to see what's currently in um, and what's currently out. Uh, it's about two thirds of the of the open issues. Um, nothing massively exciting, but um, a few new ranges, for example, for Jampu notation. Um, a new expanded set of note heads for chromatic solfege. At the moment, we just have straightforward um, solfar, sort of the seven main pitch classes, as it were, but we need to add the sharps and flats versions of all of those um, and, and so on. Um, so I am still going to work on these. Um, I'm hoping that over the summer, I'll get a bit more time to, uh, to really crack on with that. So there's been some um, interesting discussion recently about Bravura and SVG um, on the on the list, and my my plan is actually to bring the SVG font back, uh, but I need to try to find a, a better tooling solution um, uh, for that. And there's also been a couple of interesting issues raised recently about Bravura and the web font versions of Bravura, which are not strictly speaking smoothful issues, but obviously as the reference font for uh, Smoothful. It's important that it works as well as possible. So, so I've got a few um, a few technical things to look at on the tooling for the fonts in the various different formats, um, which I will tackle as well as part of the work. And as it says at the end of the slide here, if there are any other proposals, um, we're always open to to what they might be. So, just open an issue. Um, or if you're not sure whether or not you really want to open an issue, certainly to begin with, you can also post to the public mailing list as well, and we can advise. Um, if we think the issue is in scope or whether it should go on to GitHub or whatever. I don't know if anybody has any burning questions about Smoothful. Oh, Mike's got his hand up. Uh, Michael, can you unmute Mike? I think I'm, I'm unmuted now. Ah. Great. Thank you. Um, my main question is just great cat, uh, Danny. I really <laughs> like to. Um, I see just turned my... every meeting I'm doing at the moment, regardless of. <laughs> She's wanted. She's smart, so so it's just as well the brains of the operation here. 
Yeah. So my, my actual uh, things really on um, thinking about usability for the text versions of um, the fonts. And I guess I, I wanted to talk about um, one of the, perhaps the raise lower um, thing isn't doing what, what we re originally intended when you generously put that in, in terms of, I don't know if it's added to the usability, but it, um, it makes the font bigger than it is. And so, so a little bit actually less, less useful to use in text um, section than, um, than the, uh, than the original Brubber text before we added those, before you, you added those in. And, um, uh, uh, and also it just makes the font so much bigger in terms of the number of glyphs. And so uh, less, less helpful for, um, for subsetting in web applications. Uh, but one of the things I, I also uh, was thinking about in Bravura text is thinking about a kind of scaling, um, not so much for text applications, but for UI applications so that related elements are all approximately um, proportioned uh, with respect to each other in when you think about, you know, like a, a UI interface, you would never make the um, sharp sign be the size that would be in relationship to a treble clef in real life, because you would never be able to click on the, the sharp sign. On the other hand, you do tend to make the sharp sign um, the same size it would be relevant uh, with respect to um, a flat sign, even though it's a little bit smaller. So the these types of um, scaling related elements with respect to each other is something that I think we had talked about years ago as part of the eventual goal of the brother text fonts that we uh, or text versions of smoofle fonts but I don't know if that really got out there in any implemented font uh, so far thanks well I think um I sort of think that in a way, I mean, it's interesting what you say about the uh, the combining, you know, uh, ligatures that that raise and lower things. I mean, obviously, the I think that it is it isn't particularly practical to um, to use them in many, you know, because if you're going to do something in a printed document, then you might as well use a tool that can produce notation directly. Um, you know, use LilyPond or something if you want to do it in LaTeX or you know whatever. If you want to, if you want to um, put a sort of actual bit of pitched music into into a document in that way, then I think you know Bravura text isn't really the ideal way to do it. I think obviously the you know it kind of the, that goal grew out of looking at what the Bach fonts um, do and sort of trying to build on that using open type features to do some of that same work. Um, I mean it's certainly an interesting idea to to effectively remove that from Bravura text. I think that's something that we could certainly um put out to the community and see what the what the thought is um, on the subject of, of scaling things for ui i do sort of think that's a bit of a different job altogether and that's not to say that maybe there isn't room for another set of guidelines on you know how to have symbols scaled appropriately for use in user interfaces but um i think that you know it wouldn't really i think generally speaking fit with the use case for showing simple bits of music notation sort of cons consistently scaled relative to itself and to a to a regular so-called text font i'm not sure it would really necessarily kind of they, they seem on the face at least to me off the top of my head they seem like slightly incompatible goals because i don't think well, they really want a flat no, well, I, I I guess I what I was thinking is, and if you look at fonts like like the Bach font, uh, Yotamita's font, um, that we we would like to be able to have some way of using uh, these symbols such that um, if you you know if if you're working on a fixed line size like you know twelve point font or something like that, that symbols are generally distinguishable from each other so that um, you know, a double sharp sign doesn't become the tiniest little dot or a treble clef becomes a huge thing. So I think, I think that the text scaling in relationship uh, between elements for a text font is very similar also to how we think about U UI scaling for um, clicking on musical elements for in, in a, um, 
yeah, like in a menu bar or something. Yeah, I mean, I, I think the other the other challenge there is, of course, you know, those three and a half thousand glyphs in um, Smoothful and in and likewise in Bravura. And so, you know, what's the real likelihood that we're going to need all three and a half thousand of them in a user interface? Not necessarily that large. It's an interesting question, Mike, but I'm not sure I know what the answer is. I, my gut feeling, uh, you know, is just a gut feeling, is that really it's something that we should tackle separately to the to sort of the the goal of having a version of musical symbols that are consistent size with each other, but which are also consistently sized with with um, a text font, um, so that the line spacing is appropriate and and so on. Um, but I think maybe maybe we should maybe we should think about that. Maybe we should have an issue for it and and sort of collect some ideas. I mean, I know that for example, despite the fact that we've got Brevure available to us. Um, that Steinberg, obviously, just as everybody does, of course, we don't use a single symbol from Bravura directly in our UI in Dorico, not a single one. We, um, or from Bravura text, we have a totally separate UI font where we've done all of the symbols, even when they are closely related to real musical symbols. We've tended to do kind of iconic, for want of a better word, versions of them rather than using the, re the real ones from the music font um, because, you know, uh, the, the constraints and, and sort of recognizableness and the relative sizing and so on tends to be very, very different when you're designing a UI. But anyway, it's it's certainly an interesting idea. Um, both of those issues, I'd be very happy to to take to to the to the group on GitHub and and see what the consensus is. So I'll make a note when I stop talking to um, to perhaps start those issues. Or if you would like to raise those two issues, Mike, you'd also be very welcome. Okay, uh, I think, you think that's it for our Smoothful point. Thanks for the great discussion on that. And I will now turn it over to Adrian. Adrian, do you want to be sharing? You want to be sharing directly from your screen, right? So I should yes, stop. Yes, if possible, screen please. Share. Great. All right. Well, hello, everybody. For the final part of the presentation, let's talk MNX. I will share my screen here. The first thing I want to uh, talk about, can everybody see this website? All right, I'll just throw the URL into the chat so that you guys can also, or can somebody, <laughs> I can't, I don't know how to get the chat in here. Uh, can somebody pop it in there? Oh, I got it, boom. So, uh, uh, there's some big updates on MNX. Uh, the first thing I wanted to tell everybody about is that we have sort of shifted the, the design process to be less about the spec and more about examples and actually seeing stuff and sort of getting a, a real feel for how the, the new format will, will work. And the, uh, the main way that happens is through this uh, new-ish, it's new as of last summer, uh, website called MNX Common by Example. And I'll just give you a quick overview of how this is laid out. And I, I hope that you can spend some time on it, uh, some time with it on your own. The idea is we present many musical examples that are very uh, tightly focused and we display how that exact notation is marked up in Music XML and in MNX Common. Got the Music XML on the left, MNX on the right. And this is a simple one. As you get a little bit more complicated, uh, the markup obviously gets longer. So we, we collapse the differences so that uh, you only see what's, what's different between the two formats. So or the important differences. For example, for this one, uh, three note chord and half rest, we've got the, uh, you can toggle between the full document and the relevant section. And where appropriate, there's a little blurb under each one that, that talks about some of the, uh, the subtlety of uh, the differences. So I think this is, uh, for those of you who have not been involved in 
in any of our design discussion about MNX, I highly recommend checking this out because rather than wading through a gigantic specification, which is completely not finished in many, many parts, this is a much, much easier way to get a sense of how, how MNX feels. And uh, I think it kind of also in an unintentional way doubles as uh, some marketing for the, the format because it, in most cases, the MNX is a lot more terse and uh, uh, yeah, smaller than the Music XML version. And it also kind of doubles as documentation for Music XML. Uh, although that's not its, its primary purpose. So what do we have in here? It's basically like the, the bones of the format, how you do notes, how you do accidentals, how you specify parts, key signatures, time signatures. So, uh, so I'm just looking at the chat here. So this is, uh, yeah, I highly recommend everyone checks this out. And the way forward with this is whenever we're discussing a new feature of MNX, such as uh, something that we're uh, uh, talking about currently is uh, repeat bars. Uh, we are trying to move in the direction of being example first so rather than in, in uh, previously, we would have a pull request as a change to the specification. And that is, is very difficult to, for a human to understand unless you have some, some serious knowledge of the specification. So I uh, want to move in the direction of presenting examples like this. So you would say, for instance, oh, a repeat bar in Music XML looks like this. In MNX, I want it to look like this. So that's SummonX uh, by example. Like I said, check this out, get a sense of, of where we're going with the, uh, with the format. Any questions on this? Let's see if I can pull up the chat. Any questions? I do not see really anything. The example site is useful. All right. There, there was a question about adding MEI as a column. Uh, you know what, what it looks like in MEI as well as Music XML. Um, my inclination yeah. would, be, would be not to do that um, to keep it because uh, it would complicate the format and to keep that to be uh, something that is just what the W3C specification, the the community group specifications are, to compare uh, and and simplify things and make it easier to follow. Yeah, I think for now, this is, this is going to be super tightly focused. I think down the road, I can see it becoming much more uh, intense. Uh, we could basically be kind of like a Rosetta Stone uh, in terms of displaying, you know, number one, cataloging every possible musical situation. And number two, describing how to do that in every single notation format. Uh, and then maybe even extend that to every contemporary music notation program and how you do that, turning into documentation. I mean, you, you can really go overboard with this, but at the moment, this is simply for the two W3C formats, uh, Music XML and MNX. More questions? Uh, looking at the chat. How far can we trust the draft spec from James Ingram? We need more examples with different bar line types. Yeah, totally agree. The, this is a, one of the awkward um, things about the current uh, MNX status is that some stuff is really, really nicely presented like on the examples page. And then for everything else, you're sort of on your own in the deep end uh, having to go into the specification. So my take on it uh, is that whatever is specified in the spec is, is, is relatively solid and you can, uh, you can trust it. If something's in the MNX by example document, then it's, then it's 
super good, basically good to go. Uh, it, I realize that's a bit of a loosey goosey answer, but everything is um, in, in uh, fierce development. Looking at the chat now, got some MEI stuff. Can we, uh, let's talk about that at the end of this because I have a lot more of stuff to talk about. So I'm going to stop sharing that website and I'm going to share something else. And let me know if you can see this. All right. Can everybody see this stuff? My PowerPoint presentation? Good. I want to go into present mode. Oh, I thought it was in present mode. Oh, I'm I mean, going to such go. not a PowerPoint person. Do, do, do. Go to slideshow and slideshow present play play from play from slide. current slide. Is that good? No. Oops, that didn't. Oh, that changes your screen sharing. Sorry, just go back to where you had it and yeah. Oh, there we go. Are we good? Uh-huh. All right, and then the big announcement for today is that we started to work on a converter from Music XML to MNX Common. And it's, uh, yeah, it, it's, it's pretty cool. Uh, I will say right away, the, the code exists. It, it exists on GitHub in a private repository in my own personal account. And we didn't want to distribute it under my personal account. We wanted to put it in the official W3C uh, organization. And we haven't heard back from the W3C about being able to create a new repository in there. Uh, for some weird reason, we, we do not have the ability to just create repositories in the W3C uh, repository. So we're waiting for that. And as soon as that is available, then we're, we'll post a link to the mailing list. But uh, at least for now, I can give you a preview of what this thing is and what it does. So it is a free and open source Python library that will convert music XML files to MX common. And it's, uh, at the moment, it's, it's limited in scope because the format is limited in scope. We have sort of a chicken and egg situation. But uh, what I've done as my uh, North Star is to convert everything that is in the MX by example document. So that website that I just showed you, every one of those music XML examples, if you run them through this program, it generates that exact same MX common markup. And no, I didn't just hard code the, those 10 examples in, in the Python. Uh, so there's lots to do yet, but the foundation is in. And I think the, you know what, often with these sorts of projects, the hard part is just getting the, the, the infrastructure, the foundation, the bones of it. So for example, there's already a, a test system. There's all the data structures for, uh, for representing scores, all that sort of thing. So adding subsequent features will be a lot easier than it was to do the initial coding. Uh, so the goals of this- Is this, uh, is this a good point for questions? Because you have a couple of- uh, Yeah, sorry, I don't- questions. So let me screen. unmute uh, Daniel and then uh, Ben Sprantling had a question on chat, but let's, let me unmute Daniel first. I'm trying to unmute Daniel, Daniel Ray. Okay, Daniel, I think you should be. I think you can hear. I don't know if this is the right time for this particular question. I mean, we can we can put it after, but this is is um, it, this is related to MNX in general. So I don't know if it's better to 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 push this to after. Probably after, uh, I would if, think. Yeah. If it's in general, probably let's do it after. Yep. Okay. Uh, I'm just looking at the chat. I see. Which language is it in? It's in Python. Why is it Python? A couple reasons. It's something that is, is a popular language. It's something I'm very experienced in. It's, it runs on every 
operating system. The, I, I completely realize that if you're making an iOS app, an Android app, you won't be able to use this. Uh, there's, yeah, I had to, had to make a choice. So you can at least use it as a command line tool, but I'm gonna get into the goals here for, to, to give some context around what we actually intended to do. Uh, no command line tools on iOS. Yes, I know. So uh, let me go into the goals. The, the main goal is sort of the same as the, uh, the MX common by example document. It's to get away from this spec heavy, super technical kind of a development uh, process and get more to working code and, and just seeing how things feel and, and, and worrying more about the developer experience and, and how, yeah, how things feel, how they look um, in practice with, with real, real music. We also want to, uh, two bullets for the price of one concept. Uh, the third thing is we wanna get more developers involved because so far uh, it's like I keep saying that it's been more about specification and that it, it can be very dry. And if, if you're a, a developer, super technical person, you may just have your eyes glaze over it, that kind of thing. So by having real code and real examples, we hope that more developers will get involved by reading the code, running the code, running it on their own stuff, just seeing what happens. It, it lowers the barrier to entry. And in terms of the, 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 the less philosophical and more practical goals, number one is to be eventually a fully featured production ready converter between M and X and, M and Music XML both ways. So at the moment, it takes Music XML and gives you M and X. And we also want this to take M and X and give you Music XML. Why? Uh, number one, it's because we want to help. Uh, when, when M and X gets to this point, we want to help with adoption, obviously. So if you already have a Music XML importer, which I imagine m most, if not all of you do, uh, if you are capable of running Python, you can just pop this in there and then all of a sudden you'll magically be able to ingest music XML and same thing goes for export. So uh, eventually once this thing is, is fully featured and the, the specification is more ironed out, it's going to be really, really cool. And it, sort of as a secondary goal that we get for free is it's eventually uh, going to be able to serve as a cleaner for music XML files. So in order to convert music XML to MNX, music XML is, uh, as we all know, has, has some ambiguity, both in the specification and in practice, different notation apps do different things, either because they're buggy or because the specification doesn't, it is not clear enough. So, this uh, converter is going to have a fair amount of heuristics that will uh, smooth over a lot of the, the, the ambiguous stuff. It's, it's not going to be perfect. Like there are many situations that you just don't know unless you're the person who engraved it or notated it. But I think we can go a long way with uh, some automated heuristics. And I mean, many of us are already doing those heuristics anyway. And I'm starting with uh, a lot of the heuristics from my own music product, SoundSlice. So uh, yeah, this is something we'll get for free, a music XML cleaner, where you ingest music XML and spit out uh, cleaner music XML. So pause here for questions. Let's chat thing. Uh, all right. Uh, does it run Python 2 or 3? It's Python 3, of course. Python 2 was end of life at the beginning of this year. Don't tell anyone, but I still use Python 2 for my personal website, Shoemaker's Children and all that. Uh, but yeah, it's Python 3.7. So uh, what else? Uh, yeah, for 
thanks, uh, Daniel, for making the point. It's open source, and I'm going to get to this in, in a subsequent slide. So if you're really upset that it's Python, uh, you can, of course, do a line for line port if you really want. I wouldn't start that work now because it's, this thing is going to change a lot over the next few months. But you can definitely use it as a reference implementation that you can then port to other languages that I, I would really welcome that kind of contribution. And moving to the Zoom UI is really weird. All of a sudden, I have no cursor. Uh, does MNX Converter have any sort of pivot abstraction? How hard would it be to add an MEI support module to it? I'll get that get to that in a subsequent slide. It, uh, the, the quick answer, spoiler alert, is it wouldn't be that hard. And is there a problem that the music XML is breaking music XML, so you need to develop breaking music XML at the same time? I don't, James, if you could reword that one, I do not get the question. Uh, all right, and any, any raised hands? I'm, I cannot see that at the moment. All right. I no, there's go. just uh, Daniel's for the after you're done. Okay, uh, so I'll continue. I think it's always important to mention some non goals. So this uh, library has a bunch of data structures for musical concepts like beams and tuplets and notes and bars and parts and all that stuff like like we all have in our music notation apps. Uh, this is deliberately not a general purpose music notation Python library. This is not intending to be music 21. This is uh, deliberately undocumented in fact because uh, yeah, it, it's it's uh, narrowly scoped to the use case of converting between formats. So uh, that is a non-goal. Also, is not in, this is not intended to be any kind of consumer-facing tool. Like, it's not going to have music rendering or any kind of mus musicological analysis stuff or any of that. It's purely focused on conversion. The tech details, uh, as I mentioned, it's uh, just imports music XML into some data structures like we all do in our own apps. And then it converts the data structures into MNX, super, I mean, basic. And the architecture does indeed allow for import from other formats, which answers the MEI question. So it would definitely be possible to add an MEI importer or MIDI or uh, my favorite format, the Commodore 64 Music Shop a format that I grew up playing with in, an, in the 80s. Uh, so yeah, you can definitely put in your own importers and I, I would encourage that. Not right now, but because things are so in, in flux, but uh, it's the, the bones are there. And uh, as I mentioned before, it, it includes some heuristics. One classic example is in Music XML's octave shift when you have the ends of that octave shift, does that affect the first note following it or does it end on the note just before it? And different apps do different things for this. So there will be some heuristics for uh, looking at the generator of the, of the file, for example, but it will also have a way for uh, basically like some command line parameters that say, yes, always do octave shifts include the next one equals true, something like that. And of course, a, a programmatic API for that, not just via the command line. But my intent is to add, uh, it, for anything that is ambiguous in Music XML, have a way for the, the runner of this program to specify how exactly they want to interpret it if they don't want to use the automated heuristics. So that's definitely in, in the plans. And it has a comprehensive test suite. Uh, well, comprehensive for the, the minimal stuff that it does so far, but uh, the, the goal is, uh, you know, just good software development practice. Whenever there's a new feature, we want to uh, have some solid tests for it. And you can already uh, run the test suite and all the tests pass, so yay. So, uh, I'll stop there. Any, 
Any questions or thoughts? A uh, question from Lauren, do you have a direct mapping between classes and MNX elements? Yeah, good question. The, the Python data structure is basically uh, a, a direct port of the MNX concepts. And that uh, is one of the uh, one of the things that I personally found the most interesting about it, and one of the things I found the most valuable in this project so far is it's sort of the first big stress test of the MNX, the way of thinking about music notation that, that MNX presents. So yeah, it is a direct mapping. More questions on the, the tech stuff? Contributing to this might be a great learning exercise. Do I wait until the project is published? Yes, unfortunately, uh, when when uh, it's published as on GitHub as the repo, then uh, the con contributions are very, very welcome. I'll get to that uh, in a subsequent slide with how you guys can, can help. There was an earlier on. question about why not XSLT for the language? Do you want to take uh, that well, or should I'm I? I'm not a masochist is number one. And number <laughs> two, it's, uh, it's not going to be a, uh, possible to do every kind of translation that we want. Uh, so it's, yeah. And, and my experience with XSLT is incredibly painful. So this is definitely my personal bias. I haven't used it in maybe 15 years or so. So I'm, I'm sure it's gotten a little bit better, but uh, yeah, it's my, my hypothesis would be that it is either not possible to do some of these translations in, in XSLT or it's possible and it would take like 50 lines and nobody would be able to decipher them 10 minutes after they were written. So yeah, uh, that's not to stop anyone from writing their own XSLT efforts. Uh, again, this is just one reference implementation. I hope it'll be really, really good and people will want to use it, but this is not a monopoly in any any form. Was, were there any more questions? I just throw in on, on the side that you know Python is perhaps nowadays the world's most popular programming language, and XSLT is not. <laughs> so it, it's um, not to say that XSLT doesn't have its place in in things, but uh, generally large scale conversion projects like this are not where XSLT shines. Things like Automatically adding ID numbers to your music XML file. Excellent. You can do an XSLT for that. It's pretty short and it fits in. But for this type of project, uh, something like Python, I think, is, is very accessible. OK, I will move on. Some personal reactions. This was the first true test of MNX. Uh, and it felt good. I was, I was really, really excited uh, working with it. I can't claim any credit for the original design of MNX. It was done by Joe Berkowitz. And uh, I'm, obviously I've gotten to know the spec deeply in, in the last, I think two years that I've been a co-chair working on MNX, but there's a big, big difference between being intimate with a spec and actually thinking about holding the concepts in, in your head as a programmer would, because a programmer has a, an immediate challenge in, in this case, converting from music XML. And I'm happy to report it, it felt really good. It felt uh, uh, natural, well, so far, I mean, because it doesn't do that much, but uh, so far it, it has felt really, really good. And as soon as it's available, you guys will be able to have a look and, and see how you like it as well. It also inspired me to tweak my own data structures in my own notation app because uh, the MNX approach is, is very, very well thought out. And uh, yeah, it, it was, it, it, it's really a, a, a way of, of thinking about music notation. That, that's one way to think about this, uh, about MNX and, and really any music notation format, not to get too philosophical. So, how can you help or how, how can this help you when this thing is ready? 
I encourage you to see how your favorite music XML files look as MNX. Open up your favorite music XML files directory on your hard drive and, and run, it, run uh, the program on them. Uh, it can also possibly help you to look at one implementation of music XML parsing, even if you don't care about MNX, even if you're heads down on your own notation app and you want to make sure that your music XML parsing uh, is, is, uh, is doing the best it can and you just wanna see how somebody else does it. There's of course other open source code for music XML parsing, but this is yet another one that you might get some ideas from. And if you are interested in MNX, and I hope you are, this will help you get to know some of the concepts. For instance, uh, it doesn't call things voices, it calls things sequences, and it doesn't call things uh, beats or chords, it calls them events, and those sorts of things that I think uh, long-term we're obviously moving toward MNX, and the sooner you get to know these concepts, the, the better you, you are, the better off you are. And there's, there's a selfish reason it might inspire you, as it did with me, it, it might inspire you to, to make some tweaks to your own internal notation, notation data formats and your data structures. Uh, because uh, I, again, I think it's a, a, a clean way of, of uh, thinking about notation data. And uh, one thing I didn't have in the slide is, yes, you can, you are highly, highly encouraged to uh, contribute via GitHub to the, the Python package itself. Uh, let me pause for some questions and comments. I'm just gonna look at the chat here. Uh, is it the only language named after Snake? It's named after Monty Python. And is it conceivable that reflection could be used in the classes to generate XSD? I actually have never used XSD, so I do not know. I'm not sure about the Python area, but certainly as the, an XSD spec can be used with code generation tools to generate classes in many languages. I'm not sure what is available for uh, data binding and there's got to be something, <laughs> but, but I, I'm not sure what that is. So I expect you could do that in any language that is supporting reflection and that has access to uh, XSD support. So XSD, no, we're, uh, I, I, we're, we're it, uh, do we have, I forget, I think we, we just have a spec. I, do we have a schema at this point? No. Yeah. No, there's no schema. It's yeah. just no. There, yes, there will be a schema in either XSD or relaxing format. Probably XSD still because of the software support. I'm pretty confident that there will be no DTD <laughs> for, for this. Uh, other questions, or should I move forward? I. That's it from what I see, except that's for it. again for Daniel's uh, at the end. Okay. So should you start using MNX is the million dollar question. Uh, my answer is don't implement it yet unless you want to be on the bleeding edge. So if you're, if you're very, very busy with your notation app, don't, don't spend time. If you can't justify sort of playing around in an experimental fashion, I wouldn't, I wouldn't spend time on it yet. Uh, but I would encourage you to start familiarizing yourself with the concepts, like I mentioned, this concept of a sequence and event. And you can do that by simply by browsing that MNX by example document. Or if you're more technical, you can also look at the code of this converter. And uh, the naming issue. So one thing that came up as I was making this converter is, well, of course, the code has to have a name. And we can, of course, we always have the freedom of changing the names of elements and stuff within the format of MNX, but the name of the format itself, MNX Common, is kind of baked into the name of the tool. So as soon as we hit publish on, on the GitHub 
repo, it's like kind of set in stone. So it sort of forced the issue, what are we gonna call this thing? Some history for you, it started off as uh, MNX intending to encompass many kinds of semantic music notation from common Western music notation, which is what MNX common is to uh, more graphical uh, representations of music to down the road, uh, other non-Western music styles and music notations. And at the start where, uh, when Joe was putting this together, he started out with just the two, MX common and MX generic. And that's been the naming so far. And it's, it's quite awkward to always have to say MX common, MX generic. And uh, so here, here's the proposal that, that uh, we've come up with, me, me and the two other co-chairs, when we last discussed this a few days ago. We would like to just say MX common is just called MX. And for any other flavors of this format that our community group uh, creates in the future, we use a, a distinct name sort of in the same style, beginning with M and ending in X. So for M and X generic, we're, we're proposing MGX. Uh, this is not unlike Apple doing like iPhone, iTunes, iOS, you know, it's sort of a loosey goosey thing. So this, uh, this is the proposal. I just wanted to get people's thoughts on, I don't know, should we do another vote or was that a bit of a train wreck on getting people's we, thoughts. We have a couple of, well, Christina has raised her hand and there's some chat issues. So let's, okay. let me unmute Christina. I hope such a lag on this. I never know if it works or if it's just waiting. Ah, I had okay. hit a button on my end too. <laughs> um, so the, I, 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 we went round and round and round about getting to the point where we had MNX common and MNX generic. It took about two months of debate to get to this point where we are right now. I don't want to open up that thing. This was the most abbreviated version that we could come up with that actually represented what we needed it to represent is the decision we came to because nobody know we don't, we don't want, we want, we don't want to, I think this is a can of worms we really shouldn't be opening. This is, I mean, it's, it's, it, it is, so what we have to say an extra word. I, I don't, I don't think that this is a, a thing that we want to do. Um, we, like I said, we, we got in for, we got input from like all kinds of sources to go from where we were, which was like CWM and MNX or something like that in order to get to where we are now this is not a thing that I want to open as a, uh, as a can of worms at this point. And what, so just to be clear, we're the only thing changing is the, literally the name. There's no, no, I understand that. Um, but the issue was that there was supposed there that we, um, that what happens if we're doing Chinese notation, that's MCX. And then what happens if we decide to do, um, I don't know, I can't come up with two off the top of my head, two different kinds of notation that both start with a K. What do we do then? This is not, a, this is, this is not where we want to do, we, we don't want to do that. We want, we want to make it clear that these are all M and X and, and stick to where we are. Well, the, the, the question of them all being M and X is I'm not sure what the value is of that other than they're designed by with with a, a similar kind of ethos, but it's not the intent of of this whole MNX thing to to make it so that uh, the files are sort of exactly the same when they have like a file header like. You open this file, this one is generic, this one is MX common. That's something that we put aside a while back. Does that make sense? 
have a there's an interesting proposal yeah. from from Jeremy about uh, only renaming M and X common to M and X and keep M and X generic and everything else the same, which might address both the the uh, abbreviation issue for the most common one and also Christina's issue for not breaking this uh, the parallelism and, and several other folks have agreed with Christina as well about not not changing it in this way on chat. But yeah, I think I, you can bring it up as an issue to go round and round again in, in the MNX in the on the MNX issues board if we want to and see if we could come to a consensus. But I think that I I I, I dislike abbreviating everything down to three three letters. Um, I I just think that that's as as we're trying to make this a forward we were trying to make this a forward looking thing. We don't want to simplify this. Uh, simplify it, simplify it down to just the three letters when we're trying to make this a way to do more than what music XML could do. Um, yeah, I'm sorry. <laughs> that's, that's my, I guess I'm very, feel very strongly about this and I could be overruled in the long run, but that's, that's where I am on it. Yeah, there's a, a lot of discussion uh, about naming in here, which indicates to me perhaps this isn't the time to be uh, doing the naming uh, issue, but per, uh, perhaps this would be something that we can discuss as as co-chairs and see if we want to bring this up on the uh, in the uh, on an online discussion because I think we have other things to talk about in the next ten minutes besides the naming issue. Mm -hmm. But. But yeah, uh, yeah. so points taken. I, I appreciate yeah. all these lots, these lots of great feedback in, in, in the chat, and it would be hard to address all of them, but uh, people on, on, on both sides of the issue. So, so uh, yeah, I didn't have that much more. The, the next steps in terms of designing the, the format are as follows. Uh, for, for things that are already in the spec, all the, the work that Joe has done uh, my game plan is to one by one add them to the MNX by example page and at the same time implement them in the converter, sort of do it as an atomic thing. And just just go down the list and, and do it. And, and as we find wrinkles, we iron them out. And for things that aren't in the spec yet, we'll, as, as we've been doing uh, previously, we'll uh, discuss them on GitHub create issues, create pull requests, and I want to move us in the direction of, instead of just including a diff to the spec, include a diff to the MNX by example page as well, and perhaps even in implemented an MNX converter, although I realize that's a big ask for someone who just wants to uh, contribute a change to the spec. So uh, for, for new notational concepts, yeah, uh, at the very least, I think we want to include an example that we can have in the by example page along with the change to the spec. And uh, like I said earlier, it's, it's too early to start implementing this unless you're really bleeding edge kind of personality and you have time and willingness to have breaking changes in the future. But I think it's, it's safe to to start having a goal of, of reaching that start implementation milestone uh, by the end of this year. And that specifically means we're still developing this, but it's stable enough and we're not going to mess with the real core fundamental concepts. We'll probably get to a point where it's, it's stable for the fundamental concepts and then we just haven't implemented, I'll just pick a dumb example like staccato. I think things like that, uh, they've been low priority because they're, it, it, it's pretty clear how that kind of stuff will work. We, we really want to iron out the, the tricky bits first and then everything else will fall into place. So yeah, by the end of the year, I, I'd love to, to give, to send out a start implementing call. And yeah, we'll see, see how, how it goes. And that's all I had for the slides. So let's let's take it to the chat. Well, I was about to unmute Daniel, who's been waiting patiently. So <laughs> I'm good. Okay, there we go. Uh, uh, you're, are you sure you want to? 
<laughs> so I, I think that, you know, my, my comment here is probably not what people want to hear. Um, but my, are we sure that this is the best, like MNX as a standalone uh, initiative is really the best path forward, um, you know, for looking at the industry as a whole. And what I mean by this is that in the MIDI 2.0 spec, they have carved out um, essentially what they're you know, terming uh, notation over the wire. And there's an active uh, initiative by a couple of com companies that are um, involved in the MMA and are, are at, I mean, they're pretty far along in, in doing things with notation, uh, defining notation in terms of like, for example, orchestral articulations and things like that in the, in the, in the MIDI 2.0 spec. It not only is communicating information, but has the ability to also um, put theoretically to, to, to have all, all types of, of layout and placement and more structural types of, of, of visual representations in this, in, within the file format itself. And a common interchange format versus a common native format, uh, I think a common native format like that is much, much stronger. Um, you know, adopting, um, like merging this effort with the initiatives of, of MMA seems like that's a much, much stronger uh, future direction. I, I can uh, speak on that uh, as I am a member of the, uh, our company is a member of MMA and I am on the uh, standard MIDI uh, file 2.0 working uh -huh. group. I haven't, there, there have been no all we know yet from, you know, maybe there are folks who are working to spring things on the larger MMA community, but what the MMA community knows is that we want to do some sort of standard MIDI file format for 2.0. And people have discussed notation aspects to it, but I don't, I don't think having, I don't think the MMA community is the best community to be developing a notation format. I, I think that our community is, is a better one. But right, I'm, but I'm, my, I'm working my point in, is, uh, yeah, yeah, we, we, so I'm, I'm working to manage that and, and yes, we want to keep an open mind in, in terms of what the best way is to work together with the uh, MMA community on this. But MNX is intended more as a native format. Music XML is already doing the exchange format work, but it's not well suited for, for native. Yeah, but I, I just don't see a future of two different formats for encoding in, in, information like musical information like two separate things i don't see a future where the musical information all the playback information versus the i just don't see it i i i think there needs to be one singular format and that's a big i mean that's a massive massive undertaking but i i just i i don't believe in it <laughs> I mean, and, and, and it's a, a crazy thing to, to, to probably say, but I mean, I do think, yeah, are they the right people to do that? N not particularly, but I think the efforts of the two of them, uh, you know. Oh, you're, you're starting to break up. Uh, that I think that it, it, the lines between, all right, sorry. Yeah, you were, you were breaking up there. Uh, I, I think your point is very well taken, and it is certainly on what uh, part of what I am doing is is monitoring what is going on with MIDI 2.0 and seeing how uh, we can how we can best work together. Yeah, my my point is is rather than monitoring that, it seems more effective to drive that aspect um, because there is strong desire there to do that, and particularly with things being you know, the, the Japanese side, uh, you know, being more now more aligned um, with things. Anyway, that's just, I just look at like, for example, you know, where the industry is going in the future. And I just, uh, I don't see it being too connected to paper for too much longer. I mean, and it just seems like there's way too much stuff in MNX that's thinking uh, about dead trees, right? What what in MNX is thinking I, about I, dead trees? I, 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 I really <laughs> don't think so. I think, 
I, I think you're confusing it with, with music XML. <laughs> no, I don't mean, it's, it's, I, I just, I'm, I'm not a fan of, okay. yeah, well, anyway, <laughs> I get a thumbs down about paper. Yeah. What, what exactly is, is, uh... uh, it's not what's in there right now. It's just where it's, 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 it's going and the things yeah. that I'm just, I think we want to make sure other people have a chance where we're yeah. getting, we're a little bit over our time. So yeah. anybody else have comments, general suggestions? Yeah, people are pointing, there's a lot of paper. Are there open source implementations of MX, uh, music XML rendering that can render everywhere? Uh, open Sheet Music Display has a web browser that, uh, that's open source that takes music XML and puts it into VexFlow. That's the one that I know that is a web browser based open source. MuseScore is obviously open source. Uh, so there, there are several open source alternatives for music rendering, depending exactly on, on what you want. Barovio, yep. Any other, I, I'm not seeing anybody raise hand. And not seeing any more questions oh. in chat. Up, oh, it what? Ah, one more new message. EWV is raising hand in in video. Oh yes, so yes. Uh, yeah. Stretching your fingers. Jim, so uh, Jim, could you raise your hand in uh, in the participants window so I can unmute you? Because then you jump to the top, and then I can find. Ah, there you go. Great. Yes. Thank you. Thank you for reminding me. Um, so yes, this is Jim Delahunt. Um, I, separate question, separate topic. I've been talking with various people about digital scores as in di native digital documents for both um, turning into human readable documents that people, musicians can perform off of and also symbolic content that software can parse. And there's some common issues like different no transcription, public domain score transcription projects wanting to discoordinate their efforts, um, people talking about common questions about which formats to use and how to convert between formats and what editorial decisions. So we would like a forum where we could talk about all of this stuff. Is there an existing forum that's good for this kind of discussion where we should bring that conversation? Or alternatively, is it, should the W3C notation group create such a forum or alternatively should I create such a forum. I don't want to create something that already exists though. I do not know of any particular, when you say forum, do you mean a web forum or are you talking more generally about a mailing, a, a place? More somewhere? generally a place. I likely would have um, a mailing list and a web forum that are both the same content and you interact with whichever one works better for you. I don't know of any place that is doing that. So I think the question then becomes, is that something we would want to do as part of the community group or, or have as a separate effort? Uh, W3C, I don't think really provides us with great forum type things. Our, you know, when things get on the mailing list, it becomes pretty unmanageable. So we move things over to GitHub, which is great for specs and things, but may not be the best stuff for the type of discussion you're talking about because I right. think that's that's not as accessible to to the audience that you have there so unless we can think of some tooling that is good for the community group that might be something at least for now that you would want to do on your own uh, okay. I'll see if my co-chairs have other opinions on that especially if I can unmute them that's very helpful. And I guess I'd say to anybody listening, if, if you know of a forum that I should be using instead of creating something new, please let me know on chat because I don't want to make a mistake. Um, um, so I can create an issue on MX GitHub to gauge interest. But I, um, I want to provide, a, be sure there's a good place and I don't want to reinvent a wheel. Yeah, doing it on an issue and then people can think about that, uh, about where, where things are and, and, and come up with that sounds like a great idea. Great, thank you. And uh, I love this hand raising feature. 
Okay, Benjamin, you should be unmuted. Okay. Thank you. Um, first of all, thanks for all the great work you've been doing. Thank you for the great presentation. Um, you got me involved. I just registered with the W3C. Or at least with your working group. Um, and um, yeah, many thanks from my side and from the side of the Music and Coding Initiative. Um, we've been following the developments here with great interest and um, we've, we, we got our heads together and did some homework um, to get in touch with the MNX community, um, namely by um, adding a first draft of a MEI customization that sort of fits MNX specs as they are now. And also to provide a converter of MNX to MEI. The other way around isn't yet there, but um, yeah, um, the idea was to make up for a good comparison charts, sort of, and um, to, to uh, yeah, get the discussion to both communities and push things. Many thanks. Great, thank you. Anyone else? Going once, going twice. Oh, we do still have like 30 participants. So if uh, everybody can look pretty for the uh, camera, if, uh, Anybody hasn't done like uh, Adrian or Daniel done a screenshot of the gallery view. I already did one when nobody was uh, no, as, as a cameo, to. but uh, if uh, somebody can do that while everybody's smiling for the camera. Got one at the beginning of the meeting. We do one at the end of the meeting and then see how. how and then part, part, yeah, mix them in between. Yep. <laughs> so you have both beginning and end now. Hang on a second. We just get rid of the chat. Say cheese, everyone. <laughs> Got it. Thank you very much. Alrighty. Well, thanks very much, everyone, for participating. It's it's uh, you know one of the unexpected benefits of the pandemic, as a couple people have noted here, is that you know we have a lot of people. Many people here have participated in previous meetings at Music Mesa or NAM, but we've had several people participate who've never been able to come to NAM or Music Mesa, and and it's been hard to find. Uh, other, either because they can't travel or can't travel to those particular events. So I think it's worthwhile to uh, keep this in the, uh, in the mix of things for uh, our events in the future, even as uh, this lifts and we can, we can our, do our face-to-face -face meetings. I do miss not being able to have a beer with everybody uh, afterwards, but we've had really good discussion and, and, a, and a different group of uh, participation. So that's excellent. So thanks very much to everyone. We'll have the video posted and see what the transcript is like. There'll be, there's a recording. There should be a recording of the video, the audio, all the chat messages, a transcript from this, Daniel's notes. So we'll figure out the presentation material. So it may take us a, a day or two to, to get this out, but we'll, we'll have that all available, have it as a blog post and keep on uh, beginning our work on music, uh, the next version of Music XML and continuing on with MNX Common and Smoofle. Uh, is some, somebody is also raising a hand. Uh, I should unmute everybody at this point. Okay, everybody's unmuted okay, everybody's now. Un Good. Great. It's nice <laughs> right. to see everybody again. <sighs> Great to see you and everybody yep. uh, stay healthy. Good. Hear from you guys later. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 Didn't quite get to the time, Adrian. <laughs>